Hi, everyone who's with us. This is Jess Benedetto with MassCap. We'll give a few more minutes just to make sure that people get a chance to get on the line. And just a reminder before we get started, um, we are going to go ahead and keep attendees and anyone who's not presenting muted. So if you can see that option, and we'll give some more specific instructions in a minute, but just make sure that you are muted. Okay, we're at five past ten, and I don't, I don't see anybody new popping on, so we're going to go ahead and get started, and hopefully we'll have a few more join us as we get going. <clears throat> so hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the MassCap Training Center's webinar, Understanding Collective Impact, How Three Massachusetts Community Action Agencies Are Creating Collaborative Solutions to Complex Issues. Um, as I said, my name is Jess Benedetto. I'm MassCap's Training and Resource Manager. MassCap is a statewide association of Massachusetts 23 community action agencies, and the MassCap Training Center offers training and resources to enhance the ability of each of the agencies to serve their clients, develop staff and board, improve operations, expand capacity, and comply with funder requirements. Um, we're really happy to have you here today, and um, we have some great presenters coming up. So, but first, to get us started, um, we're just going to look over a few tech-related things to make sure we're all on the same page here. Um, <clears throat> so first, you should have been prompted to choose your audio option. You would want to choose either to use your computer microphone and speakers or to switch to a phone call. And if you're using the phone, remember to enter the audio pin you received. If you're using a headset, you might need to click the drop-down menu under microphone and select internal mic. For best viewing, um, you should expand your screen to full screen using the square box in the top right-hand corner of your webinar window. Um, and you should also see your GoToWebinar control panel. That's that uh, vertical rectangular box located in the top right corner of your screen. Uh, all attendees will be muted during the webinar. So if you'd like to ask a question, we're just asking folks to use the chat box in your control panel. So if you look down at the different gray boxes in the control panel, you should be able to see that. Um, the chat box is different from the questions box, so just double check that. And if the chat box is collapsed, you can expand it by clicking the arrow next to chat. Below chat box, um, where it says to, you do see the drop-down menu and select whether you'd like your question to go to all entire audience or just to staff. 
Um, so if it is a content related question or comment, go ahead and select so that everybody can see it. Um, but if you're having some technical issues or have something a little more specific, you can choose to just send it to the staff. And then if you're having any issues that we aren't able to address in the chat, you can first try closing and relaunching the webinar. And then if that doesn't work and you're still having any trouble, feel free to go ahead and email me at jessbenedetto at masscap.org. And I'll do my best to stay on top of both. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. We do have a few more people trickling in, so that's great. Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> So let's take a look at our presenters today. I'm really happy to welcome everybody. I'm here to provide an overview of collective impact and how it relates to the Community Services Block Grants community level goals. We have Patricia Pelletier, a very um, wonderful colleague of mine. Patricia has worked with the Massachusetts Association for Community Action, or MassCAP, for more than 15 years as the planning and workforce development consultant, um, encompassing many different activities from research, writing, training, project management, planning and development, community of practice facilitation. She's done it all. Um, she's also part of Ma the MassCap Training Center team putting together these wonderful trainings for everyone. Patricia has more than 40 years of experience working with nonprofits and community action agencies. And um, delving into deep, the deeper case studies, um, <clears throat> I'll first welcome Patricia, sorry, um, delving deeper into the case studies of how their own community action agencies have worked to develop, implement, and report on collective impact initiatives. We also have Lillian Romero, Patricia Pisoni and Lev Ben-Ezra. So welcome to all of you as well. Um, just to give you a little background on these wonderful ladies. Um, Lillian has served as Chief Program Officer at Lynn Economic Opportunity, or LEO, since 2015, and has over 20 years of leadership experience in social services at both the nonprofit and state level. Prior to LEO, Lillian worked at the state for nearly a decade as a regional director for the Department of Transitional Assistance overseeing offices in Boston, um, southern and north regions of the state. Over the past two years, she's concentrated on advancing the mission and goals of LEO through the implementation of new programmatic initiatives, and currently she serves as chair of the community engagement team for Impact Lynn Collective Impact Initiative, which you're going to be hearing about today. Trisha Pistoni serves as vice president for planning, policy, and development at Montachusett Opportunity Council, or MOC, in Fitchburg. Her focus is on improving the vitality of the region and helping to strengthen its resources. Trisha has 20 years of economic development and social service experience. Uh, as the Vice President of MOC for the past 10 years, she's gained experience in the areas of program management, planning, marketing, development, and finance. She also has a solid policy and political background that has provided her the opportunity to work for many national figures, including Senator Edward Kennedy, Senator John Kerry, and Congressman John Olvera. Over the past two years, she served as the director of the Reimagine North of Maine initiative, a collective impact model aimed at improving the quality of life in a neighborhood of Fitchburg. So we're really excited to hear about that one as well. And then we have Lev Ben-Ezra, who has served as the director of youth programs at Community Action of the Franklin, Hampshire, and North Quabbin region since 2010, and has 12 years of leadership experience in youth development and anti-poverty programs. Lev is a passionate manager with a deep commitment to social and economic justice, who uses her expertise in positive youth development, staff development, and positive leadership to improve program quality, increase participant engagement, and support a staff who are highly effective and excited to come to work every day. Lev also chairs the Communities That Care Coalition, which we'll be hearing about, and that is a youth substance use prevention coalition in Franklin County, which has been recognized nationally and inter internationally for its effective use of collective impact to reduce youth substance use and risky behaviors over the last 14 years. Um, so we have a really great team here today um, to teach a, a little bit more about collective impact and share their own stories. <clears throat> so looking at the learning objectives for today's webinar, <clears throat> um, as a result, we're hoping that participants will come away being able to identify the elements of a collective impact model, understand the breadth and depth of what collective impact really means, get real life examples of collective impact initiatives at community action agencies in Massachusetts, understand how collective impact could be a strategy to do community level work, and receive additional resources on collective impact. So before we get started, we're going to do a little poll. So I'll um, look at the questions here and then I'm going to launch it. So you should see it pop up on your screen in a minute and you'll just want to select your answer. If for any reason that's not working, you can go ahead and just type in the chat box what letter you're choosing. Um, so we're just curious about what your experience is with collective impact at this point. Um, so A, I know about it from research I've done or info I received. B, I'm aware of a collective impact initiative in my area. 
C, my agency is a partner in a collective impact initiative. D, my agency is a backbone agency for a collective impact initiative. Or E, I have no knowledge about collective impact. So I'm going to go ahead and give that poll a whirl right now. Give me a moment. Okay, so that should be popping up in your screen, and you can just go ahead and, and choose what, what applies the best. Great, we've got about half of folks who have voted so far. It's looking like we have a number of people here with us that have their agency as a partner in a collective impact initiative, which is exciting. Um, so it's great. I'm, I'm curious about the different types of participation, um, whether agencies are backbone, although I guess they would have chosen that. So right now we have 10% are backbone agencies. We have folks who, about 20%, who know about it through research. So far, no one says they don't have any knowledge about collective impact. I guess if you didn't know it existed at all, you wouldn't be here today, but, um, but that's good to know where at least we have some information. Great, we have about 91% of a voted. I'll just give a few more seconds for anybody who hasn't voted yet, just to, um, they say voted, but who hasn't given their best answer so far. Great, so we're at 100%. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Excellent. So we have 18% know about it from research, 18 are aware of a collective impact initiative that might be going on in their area. We have 55% of you all um, who are a partner in a collective impact initiative, and then 9% where the back, uh, agency is actually a, a backbone agency. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Patricia Pelletier, and she's going to talk a little bit more about community level work in general, and then lead into the case studies for us. Hi, everybody. I hope you can all hear me and see my um, screen, which is a slide that says, what is collective impact? Um, thank you all for coming today. Um, I thought I'd start with a short background on where the term and concept of collective impact came from. For those of you who don't know, but it looks like most of you do based on the poll, but so this will be just a bit of a refresher. So um, in the winter of 2011, Foundation Strategy Groups, or FSG, uh, John Kenya and Mark Kramer from Boston introduced the concept of collective impact in an article by the same name. Uh, which described several examples of highly structured collaborative efforts and had um, achieved, that had achieved substantial impact on a large-scale social problem. Response to that article was overwhelming. Hundreds of organizations and governments from around the world, including the White House, reached out to FSG to describe their efforts to use collective impact and to ask for guidance on how to implement these principles. Many federal initiatives under President Obama, including WIOA, cite collective impact as a way to make real and lasting change. So collective impact is described as the commitment of a group of actors from different sectors to a common agenda for solving a specific social problem using a structured form of collaboration. Collective impact occurs when organizations from different sectors agree to solve a specific social problem using a common agenda, aligning their efforts, and using common measures of success. So I'm going I'm to show you just a short video uh, from FSG about collective impact. I hope, I hope the technology works, but let's see. It'll just take a second here to load. Um, here we go. The number and complexity of challenges facing our world can be overwhelming. When individual organizations attempt to tackle the most daunting problems, success stories are all too rare. Many innovative approaches have been tried. Too few have worked. However, when organizations work together under the right conditions, they can accomplish great things. One particularly effective means of collaboration is collective impact. 
Using the collective impact approach, a number of complex social challenges have been addressed and some remarkable results have been achieved. Youth incarcerations dropped by 45% in just three years with no change in public safety, improving the lives of thousands of youths. 6,000 public housing residents were placed in new jobs during the recession. More than 1,000 acres were restored and over 280 million pounds of pollution voluntarily reduced to conserve and restore a river. Organizations utilizing a collective impact approach do the following. Agree to a common goal. Agree to track progress in the same way, which allows for continuous improvement. Do what each does best while identifying new ways to work together. Have consistent communication. And finally, have skilled and dedicated resources to support ongoing efforts. The world's toughest challenges aren't going away. In fact, many experts predict they will continue to grow in both number and complexity. Solving these problems requires a range of expertise from a number of diverse organizations. Collective impact is a proven approach, helping organizations work together to move mountains. So that um, looks like it worked. Um, <laughs> so you can see that you really can achieve some really incredible uh, results and impact from a collective impact approach. So, but why are we talking about collective impact in the context of the work we do at community action agencies? Um, as you may know, Community action agencies will begin reporting on what on what the new Roma NG or Next Generation guidelines are calling community level national goals. While community action agencies have always done community level work, how we report the outcomes and impact of that work has changed. This isn't a webinar on Roma, so if you have questions on Roma or Roma NG or, or community level goals, you might want to ask your planner or, or Roma certified trainer or implementer. So the three national CSBG Roma NG goals are individuals and families with low incomes are stable and achieve economic security. Communities where people with low incomes live are healthy and offer economic opportunity. And people with low incomes are engaged and active in building opportunities in their communities. The National Association for State Community Services Programs, or NASCASPs, says that at the community level, Roma Next Generation will allow CAAs to capture the scope or scale of the impact or intervention, will show movement on the larger community or population level changes, and will show progress over time and be easy to understand and allow some meaningful summaries um, at the national level. The uh, number of, uh, so that, that to frame how we look at and report on the, those three national goals is a set of national performance indicators, or NPIs, which is a term that um, has been around for a while um, that people should be familiar with. The, the MPIs have changed, however, uh, based on those three goals. And the ones that are associated with national goal three are that the number of community members working with community action to improve conditions in the community and um, the number of community members working toward other indicators specified for a collective impact initiative or partnership with at least one other organization. So you'll note that collective impact is specifically stated as an indicator to measure community level work. However, it certainly isn't the only way to do and report on community level work. NASCASP also states that community measures must uh, capture the scope or scale of the impact intervention. Uh, show movement or larger community level change and show progress over time, be easy to understand, like I said, and allow some meaningful summary and show what changed at the community level. So you can see how a collective impact approach might be an effective community level work strategy. There's a lot of information on collective impact at the FSG website and other resources that we'll email you after the webinar. Um, 
The best way, though, we think we can demonstrate some collective impact work is to have some of our Massachusetts community action agencies tell you about the collective impact initiatives that they're involved with. So, I, uh, so I'd like to, um, to start us off, I'd like to introduce Lillian Romero from the Lynn Economic Opportunity, who will talk about their collective impact initiatives. Just give us a second to change over to our presenter screen. Thank you, Pat. Um, and I am uh, honored to be here with all of you today. And I hope that you can hear me fine. Um, and with that, I'm going to start. So I wanted to give you a little background information with regards to how we started an impact effort here in Lynn, which we now call an impact Lynn. Um, I'm sure some of you are already familiar, um, but in 2016, uh, here in Lynn, we uh, gather and agree to collaborate, and we were working on submissions of two different grants. One of them was the Working City Challenge, which you're going to hear later on uh, from one of those that did get the grant. Uh, I think it was on the initial uh, start of this initiative. The second one was the Promise Owned, and this was an effort that uh, it was a federal uh, application. So we had over 15 agencies in Lynn that came together, started working, and we decided, um, despite the fact, even if while well, we were waiting for a response on whether we were uh, granted um, those two different um, um, uh, grants, that we would continue with the effort. Um, so while that we were waiting, uh, the, the team here at, at LEO, um, that would be the Brigitte Damon, who's our CEO, uh, Executive Director, the Director of Communications and Development, and I attended a, our first conference, which was uh, regarding collective impact. We learned so much during that conference that we came back and were all energized about what everybody else was doing, that we came back and since we had already laid down the groundwork, we decided that this was going to be the approach that we were going to follow. So at this slide, you have uh, what we are calling our, the day that everything started for us. Um, this is a picture of um, a meeting we had where all the organizations came in together and we had a brainstorming session. And we all were sitting and we all had in our tables different color paper and we all had goals. Um, it was a whole entire day event for us. We hired a consultant that came in to facilitate this effort. Um, and this is how we started. This is how our impact lens started. It's really started on October, October 6th. Um, what is impact lens? Impact lens is a group of cross-sector partners who have agreed to focus measure efforts to create system change to improve the education and income levels and community engagement or residents of Lynn. Um, you heard about um, uh, the description that Pat had gave us, which indicates, you know, we all agreed to common goals. So that's what this is. So this is how we became. Um, so part of the, of the agreement was that on this day, we also had a presentation from different softwares. We had already chosen one that we thought was best fit for us. And on that day, we decided that, yes, this is what we want to do. This is the software that we will be purchasing. So that's how we started. Uh, currently, we have four different committees, and I'll be talking about those committees that make impact lend. Who is involved? It's a collaborative team of residents, business leaders, uh, uh, the state, federal interests, and dozens of nonprofits. Um, right now, we have an advisory team, which is comprised of representatives from the Lynn Housing Authority, Lynn Economic Opportunity, the North Shore Community College, the Lynn Public School, the Mass Development, and the 6th Congressional District's Office. They're heavily involved on this effort here, here in Lynn, and we really uh, can honestly say that, you know, it's been a tremendous uh, resource for us to come together and have uh, the state and federal interests helping us with this, with this effort. Um, so that's where we are. Um, during this time, we also secured some funding. So we were able to get a small grant that allowed us to hire a part-time um, uh, person who is literally coordinating all of this for us. Um, with that also, um, that's a, a, a small grant that is secure for the next three years. We also um, 
of Puerto de Software. Um, that was another of our partner agencies, uh, Alehan, who decided to invest the resources on that effort. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about today is the group that I'm, I'm leading. Right now I'm chairing this group, the community engagement team, but eventually it will be turned to, to the, the residents um, of Lynn to really lead the group. Um, so our group is started very small. Um, we have residents, we have nonprofits, and we have the faith community um, as part of our, our team. Um, one of the things that I wanted to share with you, some of these lessons, um, when we first started, we, we were relatively new. Um, so we have already made some mistakes that we have learned from um, and had adjusted. But that, that is exactly what collective impact is. You adjust. And that's why you are tracking everything, because you need to be able to change as things are changing. If something didn't work, then why didn't work and how we can change it. So we already had some of those lessons. Um, an example of that, uh, we started in, like I said, in, in October. Our collective uh, community engagement team, we had our first meeting. And prior to that, you know, I had a plan on who was going to be part of it. We did ex I did extensive uh, outreach. I have a team of volunteers that helped with that effort as well. And um, we made tons of phone calls. We were expecting at least a dozen people to our first meeting late in October. And at the day of the meeting, we only had a very few people that came in. Um, of course, you know, the panic set in and it was like, oh my goodness, what happened? How come people didn't show up? And one of the things that you're going to hear later on is about, you know, meeting people where they are. So I thought I had reached out and met individually. We called them, we emailed them, um, we remind them about the meeting, but the day of the meeting came and only a few came. So we had to go back and figure out what happened. So. Uh, it wasn't until one of my volunteers indicated that in many ways, you know, the group that we were trying to, to get engaged, um, it's functioning very differently from what I, I was expecting. Um, we did everything. Um, but what we had failed to do was um, check in with them with regards to language barriers. We had indicated that there were going to be some translation services, and um, we were going to have that available for them. But that was one of the lessons. The day came, they all got nervous, and although they spoke, they do speak English, um, they're not as comfortable when it's in a larger setting. So that was one of the lessons that we had to figure out how to address. Um, so I went back to them um, and met and, and, and asked them, you know, what happened? You know, is there anything we did, and anything we can change? And that's when I came to realize that that's exactly what happened. They are comfortable speaking in their own language, which is Spanish, but they're not as comfortable when they're in a setting where um, there's other people um, who um, do not speak Spanish. Um, so one of the things that we did was that, OK, so we had a larger group, and we divided the two groups. So now I have a group that speaks English and a group that is a Spanish speakers. Um, the, response to, to that difference to those two groups was tremendously. The Hispanic population, it's totally engaged. We meet once a month. Um, and we right now have about seven different churches. It's the largest group of all that I have. And they're completely engaged in the effort. So that was one of, one of the things that, you know, you, you think you're doing everything right. And, and, and sometimes you forget small detail, which is a huge detail when it comes down to language barriers. Um, then the second um, thing also that, that we, we did prior to all of this is, you know, knowing your target audience. Um, I'm originally from Guatemala, so I, I grew up in Guatemala, but I, um, I didn't work there. So all my work history has been here in the United States. So when I was trying to engage certain group, I was trying to set up appointments like we always do. We call and try to set up an appointment so we can go and talk to them. Um, but I didn't realize that in a lot of ways, this specific group continues to function as they did back in the native country. And it's not just uh, an issue for Guatemalans. I don't know how familiar you are with Lynn, but in Lynn we have a huge uh, population of Guatemalan immigrants. It's the largest group that we have here in the city. So. One of the things that I had to switch was, you know, uh, do what we do in Guatemala, which a lot of times you just show up and wait. Sometimes you have to wait a long time, and hopefully they'll see you. Uh, and if they don't, then just set up an, an appointment. So that's another thing that you need to keep in mind when you're trying to engage.
engage the residents, really get to know them. You really need to know the culture, find out who those leaders are within that culture and learn what functions within within their culture. Sometimes, you know, just because you are from the same country doesn't mean that, you know, that you uh, are informed of all the different things because we all come from different sections of, of a country and that sometimes can be a difference. So that was a lesson for us um, that I, we had to learn. Um, so collective impact, principles of collective impact, we heard in the video that you watch uh, about the five conditions of collective impact, but those conditions alone are not sufficient. The combination of the five conditions of collective impact and the principles of practice contributes to a meaningful community level change. And that's a key thing. Um, I highlighted community members because in our effort, might be different for different efforts depending on what it is that you're trying to achieve. But for here, for Impact Lane, the community members are at the center of everything. They really are the ones who are going to be guiding us in the future on what we need to change, what's working and what's not working. So you need to keep in mind all of those things. Um, building a culture, a culture that fosters relationship, trust and respect is one of the key things. Um, and that's uh, one of the things in here. And that's one of the things that I failed to recognize when I set up my first uh, uh, community engagement meeting. The trust was still not there. They were not as comfortable to come and say, I don't speak as much and as because of that, I don't feel as comfortable being in a meeting where there's gonna be other people that don't speak, Spanish, don't speak Spanish. So that was one of the things that I, I thought I would highlight in here because it was a lesson learned for me. Um, then the second thing also that I find um, that I were at least in Lynn, um, something that I have to constantly remind uh, people is the difference between outreach and community engagement. Our population is used to us doing our reach, informing them of what services we have and when we have them, when something starts and when something ends, but they're not uh, used to a community engagement where we're literally at the table and we're asking their input because we want to know in order for this to work, they need to be the ones telling us what's going to work for them. So that's one of the things that I had to do. So these two definitions, I literally took them from the dictionary, So, um, but they are so crucial to make sure that we're constantly reminding people of the difference. Um, this community engagement, it is, as it says, you know, it applies to collective vision for the benefit of a community. And those are the things that, for my group, I'm constantly reminding them. I have this slide for them translating in Spanish, so every time that someone forgets something, we, we have it available to them. And it's, and it's a key slide. Uh, it's a simple thing because you would think that you would, would remember those. But sometimes we have to always remember who our audience is. And sometimes we have to remind certain words that might have a different Different, um, different meaning. So for them, I translated this to Spanish, and we have it as part of the package. This, this other slide is another one, um, and I apologize, the, it's not as clear as, as it should be, but to me, the Community Engagement Toolkit is my to-go document. I, I am following uh, a lot of the initiatives, a lot of the examples that they have, and uh, that's one of the things that I have found very useful, so I thought I'd put it in here. There is a link at the at the end. There's another slide with all the links, so that's part of it, and I just noticed that you can't see uh, my source in there, but it's all about um, um, FSG, and so you'll have it at the end of this slide as well. So currently, like I said, I'm using this. And one of the differences is that when you start, you have your collective impact effort. You really need to think about what is the level of involvement that you want from the community members. Um, there are five different um, sections in here, information, consulting, involvement, collaborating, or empowering. We are right now because we're starting in the process of informing them, um, but we are going to be um, teaching them because our goal is to have the um, members of the community be the ones uh, making the decisions. They will have the authority. So that's the long-term effort that we are working towards. But we have to start somewhere, which is providing the tools. And that's part of the community engagement um, strategies that we're coming out, how we're going to get them all the way to empower them. Um, so those are one of the things that the initial conversations as, as you start your collective effort to figure out what is the level of involvement that you're looking for. And you really need to think about it because one of the things is a common agenda, as we heard in the video, but you also have to be very transparent about everything. So I have shared this slide with my team um, in here and they know that we're working towards getting them all towards the empowering part of it. 
um, so that's that's a key key thing. Um, the second thing that I also have, and like I said, I'm I'm constantly looking at, and that is one of the things that I'm constantly reviewing, is making sure that I'm in point every time I meet with uh, people from the community, and this is also from the community um, the um, uh, community engagement toolkit. And I do see that it does have my source um, in here. Um, so I want to uh, bring your attention to this number uh, number two, meet them where they are. That is a key thing. Um, when setting up meetings, and we all know that, you know, it's not about us, it's not about our schedules. We are used to meeting from nine to five. But when you want to engage the community, you have to be there on the weekends, you have to be there at nights. Sometimes it's from seven to nine, um, sometimes it's on Saturdays. So those are the key things that make a difference to them. Um, so that's one of the things that we've done. The meetings are set up based on their schedule, based on when they're available, and if there needs to be a change, we make the change. We're very flexible when it comes down to that. The second one that I also want to point out is number four, knowledge and mitigating power differentials to ensure fair treatment. Um, I have an example for you guys in here. Um, so I, my early example that I said that my group, I had to divide them because of the language barrier. So we learned from that and we realized that people don't feel as engaged if they're not listening to the message in their own language. Even when they do speak a little bit of English, they're more um, up to participate if it's in their, in their own language. So since then, one of the things that uh, Leo and Elhan, the Lynn Housing Authority, has done is that we purchase a translation equipment. And this is a, available to all the organizations in the city. They can use it anytime. Um, and we actually at Leo are also using it for our policy council meetings. It has made those meetings more smooth. It actually stays in uh, with the, t the time limit that they have because now the translations are happening simultaneously. And that is key. People are feel more engaged that they're part of the conversation because as anyone is, is speaking in English, they're tra we're translating it. So we hope in the future to have more language. We have a capacity for up to three languages and we hope in the future to expand to more languages. Um, so that's one of the things that we're doing. Also, one of our commitments is that our next impact link meeting where all the communities will come together. We now have the equipment, but we also committed to hire professional translators to ensure that every single member feels included in this meeting. And it won't matter whether they speak English, Arabic, or Spanish, or any other language, we'll have that capacity. So that's one of the things that, you know, when we mentioned it to them, they were all so eager to um, first to, 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 to uh, participate because their engagement will be very different from what it used to be. So that's that's a key thing. Um, and the next thing, which is my last my last slide, I want to leave you with who we are and what our goals are for collective impact here in Lynn. There are four different goals that we have. We have four different committees that have formed. We have an early education committee. We have a housing committee. We have a public safety committee, and we have our community engagement committee. Right now, we're all working um, currently, and this is the reason why I don't see as much information on where we are with everything, because we are still putting it together. We are doing all the background work, um, and we are currently working and developing our goals and strategies, and soon we will have an official announcement of our collective impact effort here in Lynn, Impact Lynn, where we will unveil our logo. We're working on that, a website, and more opportunities for people to get engaged. And I think that's one of the things that um, once we have all this in place, um, we will have even a bigger group with regards to our collective impact and community engagement. So that's one of the key things for us. And with that, I would like, and as, as I promised, I have a little um, slide here with all the resources. And as Pat indicated, Pat and Jess indicated, we will be emailing this information to you. But with that, I would like to now switch the microphone to your next presenter, Chris Bristoni, who will be talking to you about the effort. And thank you. Thank you, Lillian. This is Pat Pelletier. Before Tricia comes on, I had just uh, missed a really important point at the beginning um, that the, uh, the way we've ordered the presentations um, are through the kind of a collective impact life cycle, which are beginning, middle, and sustaining. So Leo's um, um, Collective Impact Initiative is at the beginning stage. Um, MOCs, uh, will, you'll see, uh, will be at somewhat of a middle stage. 
and then the Community Action Franklin, Hampshire, Quabbin region are at the uh, sustaining stage. So that was a bit of a, a thing, I, a important thing I forgot to mention at the beginning. So you can kind of frame it that way in your mind. So here's Tricia. Thank you, Pat. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Perfect. Great. Um, thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as Jeff mentioned, uh, my name is Tricia Pistoni. I'm the Vice President of the Montachusett Opportunity Council and serve as the Project Director of the Reimagine North of Maine Initiative, uh, a collective impact model here in Fitchburg. My goal today is to provide you with a little more context around the idea of collective impact, including the five pillars, as well as a couple other components to consider, um, maybe reinforce some of the things that Lillian already mentioned around resident and consumer involvement and leadership development, and how you can apply it to your own community level work. I also want to take a deeper dive into different issues uh, and uses of collective impact and lessons learned after three years, almost four years of us working on community level change. As I, as I mentioned, my project is the Reimagine North of Maine initiative. Um, over the next couple of slides, I'll just describe our work, but I'll use the context of the five conditions for collective impact to do so. So what is Reimagine North of Maine? Our mutually reinforcing activities, or WHO, is made up of a partnership of local businesses, government, residents, and partner agencies. And I'll go into a little more detail on who those include in a moment. Our shared measurement is really our, one of our guiding principles. While we have three areas of focus, resident engagement, neighborhood development, and economic development, we are focused on implementing data-informed and data-driven strategies, including investing in data technology and tools where it may not exist, especially at the municipal level in Fitchburg. I would also say that while we have some traditional programming underway, the vast majority of our work has shifted to really be PSC, policy systems and environmental efforts to achieve our mission. So our common agenda is to make the North of Maine a place of choice, a place where people want to live, work, and invest in play. As the backbone agency, MOC provides, through myself and a full-time coordinator, the overarching structure. We do data management, we provide fiscal support, we do policy and advocacy, we provide communication, facilitation, and sort of the overall alignment of resources and capacity. We have three other main partners, the City of Fitchburg, Fitchburg State University, and New View Communities, which is our local CDC. We have 35 other partner agencies and also work to engage 4,500 residents in our target neighborhood in our work. As mutually reinforcing activities go, our vast partner list has varying degrees of integration. Some partners, such as New View, do all their work in the neighborhood to align with our overall efforts. The university and the city also work to align their efforts in the downtown and neighborhood with our vision because they realize the benefits of working in this collective. And lastly, while other par partners have been given some seed money to improve capacity in the neighborhood, others work to change their current programming to better align and coordinate with our overarching goals. Lastly, we have two funders, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and the Health Foundation of Central Mass. And I'll talk about them over the next couple of slides and how they support our work. So to date, we're in our fourth year. We have progressed from assessment to planning to now implementation. And while we're still working on tactical efforts, we are setting the groundwork for sustainability into the future. As we all know, this work can take many years. Um, so while we feel like we're, we're really moving along, we know that our vision may take 10 or 20 years to achieve. To date, we have secured over $1.7 million to invest in this target neighborhood, which has leveraged approximately $3 million in additional investment. I show you this slide not to deter you from the work, as you don't need $2 million to do collective impact. But I would say that this work does take some additional financial resources and capacity to support the work of the backbone agency. 
Um, as Lillian mentioned, having a half-time person, a project coordinator is essential. You, it's important to have somebody who wakes up every single morning focused on the work that you're trying to achieve. Continuous communication, which is really the last of the five conditions, is such an important element and one we really struggle maintaining as we need to communicate with so many different people. Our partners, our residents, our businesses, our local media, people who live in Pittsburgh, people who live in the region, as well as our funders consistently. These next few slides have been produced using local resident survey data as well as census data to educate partners, funders, and residents of the needs of the neighborhood. Again, we always try to be data-driven in our work. When we began our work, we knew that we wanted to use data to improve both the conditions as well as the perceptions that existed in Pittsburgh. We considered focusing on a citywide effort that took on workforce development, education, or crime. Very issue-focused. In the end, we decided to focus on a targeted neighborhood, while that, even though it had the highest needs in terms of housing and poverty, it was also home to many of the city's greatest assets. I think it is important that you are hearing during this webinar both programmatic approaches as well as neighborhood community development approaches using collective impact with the goals of impacting population outcomes. Our initiative, Reimagine, is a neighborhood development approach. So here is a map of the, the North Main. As you can see, this really is highlighting our assets of the university, our Main Street corridor. We have a beautiful art museum and a commuter rail station. The so North of Maine, uh, Fitchburg is population is around 40,000. Um, we're targeting in a neighborhood about 4,500, which is about 11% of the um, city's overall population of which more than 40% live um, at or below the poverty line. One in three homes is below average quality. Nearly 50% of the Main Street buildings are vacant along our commercial corridor. And this is from the data from um, surveying residents that while 95% of the residents feel safe during the daytime, it drops down to 51% that feels safe at night. Another important point I want, want folks to take away from today is that this work is very adaptive, and practitioners of collective impact need to be very flexible in their work. That is not to say that you change course on a dime, but rather you use data to inform your work. When you're not seeing the impact of the work over a, a short amount of time, or unable to measure the data, almost more importantly, that you've identified, then a course correction may be necessary. We started off initially with six areas of focus and realized that we were just institutionalizing silos. So we practiced an uh, effort of creative destruction and narrowed our work into three areas, neighborhood development, community engagement, and economic development. From there, we needed to be goal-driven and identified, identified one overarching goal for each focus area. So for neighborhood development, we identified increasing the quality of neighborhood life. For community engagement, increasing the collective impact of our team with the residents in the neighborhood. Economic development was to increase the number of viable Main Street businesses. From there, as I mentioned, we have four main partners and 35 additional advisory partners. While there are multiple projects happening at any one time in each focus area, we fund and add capacity to what we call signature projects. So the signature project for neighborhood development was to implement a marketing plan in the North of Maine neighborhood. For community engagement, it's to create a network of engaged residents and stakeholders. And for economic development, it is to provide support to small businesses on the Maine on Main Street. All of these projects take time, even five to ten years for some of them, so therefore we need to make sure that we are measuring outcomes and outputs that can serve as a proxy to longer-term community-level outcomes. Some are qualitative, such as perceptions of the neighborhood, while other are more outputs or quantitative, reduction in the number of commercial vacancy, for example. 
So as I was mentioning signature projects, just to highlight a few signature projects that we have done over the last few years, um, again, being very focused on data-driven um, approaches, the city of Pittsburgh didn't have good data around code enforcement. So we purchased them software that they could then conduct code enforcement and be able to um, collect that data. And now we're able to go back after a year of this being implemented to start analyzing and move from single issues to what are the trends happening in the city around code enforcement. We also, again, lack of data around commercial property vacancy rates on Main Street. We hired an architect to go in and um, do inventories of the commercial properties to better understand what type of stock we had in the Main Street. Residents, and sorry that that's cut off, but resident um, engagement is really important. So social cohesion was one of our approaches. In, in the neighborhood is getting people together, getting people to know their neighbors, and then sort of onboard them to opportunities around resident engagement and resident leadership. And I also mentioned that we provided some seed funding to some of our partners. Um, one was purchasing pianos, old pianos, and painting them and putting them out in public spaces on our main street as well as funding um, uh, orchard, allowing seniors to come out in the neighborhood to, um, to garden. Um, I would just like to add, uh, you know, it's an important takeaway from this work, is that Rome was not created in a day and it wasn't done by one person. Um, this graphic just tries to depict the complexity of implementing community level work and the need for constant interaction between everyone. I would also offer that the process of doing this work is almost more important than intended outcomes. Um, we at Reimagine develop guiding values that include reciprocity and trust. And while it sounds easy, these two values are constantly challenged. This work is, is very hard, but I've also found that some of the best strategies and outcomes have been created after very difficult meetings or complex discussions. We have also found that unintended outcomes are always happening, sometimes good, sometimes bad. So it's really important not to ignore them, even more capture them and record them as data. Um, these lessons learned are very similar to what Lillian um, put up on her side. And I think it's important to note that this isn't just a, a textbook list of possible lessons learned. But these are all aha moments that many in the field, including myself, and I, I believe Lillian as well, um, have seen in their own work. Um, the idea of focusing on program policy and systems change, building a, a culture of trust, customizing for local content, um, designing and implementing with a priority on place. Um, and I think two of my favorite takeaways from Collective Impact is that it's OK to fail. Um, testing, as long as you're using data and measuring and evaluating, it truly is okay to fail um, and allow the next person to take on this work to start off from the place that you left off. And also the idea that there's no silver bullet, but this is a much more of a buckshot approach. Um, therefore, you always have efforts going on simultaneously. And again, using data to identify which strategies have the best impact on your overall goals. Um, before I turn it over to Lev, um, I'll ask if there is any questions. Jess, do you want to help me out on this? Sure. Um, we are running a little bit over on time, so we just want to make sure um, that we do get a chance to listen to folks, but I think we'll hold questions until the end. Um, okay, perfect. Yeah, so, and, and just wanted to put it out there that we understand if anybody has to jump off at 11 or shortly thereafter, we're going to be going a little bit longer. Um, Lev section is really interesting, so I hope you can all stick around. Um, yeah, so with that, thank you so much, Trish, and I think um, you're going to lead us through a quick poll. Sure. Do you want to do that or do you want yeah. to move on, Lev? We'll do the poll. Okay, great. Um, so the poll question um, that I am going to present um, is if you, if you have decided to not develop or join a collective impact project in your service area, what is the main reason? Um, and we won't spend too long. Like I said, we're running a little low on time. But if folks just want to answer quickly, the poll should have popped up on your screen.
It should have popped up. We don't have anybody voting so far. So maybe we'll just go ahead and um, just, just take a, a minute kind of to think about it to yourself. Um, so far we have some folks saying that they are already, col already collaborating with others and don't really see a need. Um, so that's an interesting point. Um, we have some folks that think it seems a little too time intensive to join or develop. So for everyone else, do you want to close out the poll then? Yeah, we'll go ahead and close it up just so that we can get moving. Great. Great. So for everyone who didn't vote, I'm assuming that you either are in a collective impact project or very excited to start one. Um, but if I can just maybe give a few comments or feedback regarding um, those that may be hesitating this work. Um, I truly believe that community action is structured to leave this level of community level initiative. And while Roma Next Generation is still being worked out, I believe the intent of better measuring community level work by accepting that this work takes many years, um, and also the thought of thinking about it differently about how we measure both these short and long term goals are important. Uh, we need to maybe move away from the widget counting of just how many partners we're working with and really start taking credit for the greater impact that our agencies have at a community or population level. And while it does take additional resources and capacity to do this work, the end game is really worth it. So thank you. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Lev um, Benezra, who is the, excuse me, the Director of Youth Programs at Community Action of Greenfield, Franklin, and Hampshire. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me, and I apologize to the audience that we are running a little bit behind. Uh, I know we have just a couple minutes before 11. Uh, my presentation is about 12 or so minutes, so I certainly hope that folks are able to stay on um, and I'm available to continue afterwards, as are the other presenters, to answer any questions. So looking forward to having you all here. Um, so yes, uh, as I mentioned, I am the director of the Youth Programs Department at Community Action of the Franklin Hampshire North Quabbin Region out here in Western Massachusetts. And in addition to my role as the director of our Youth Programs Department where I oversee our leadership development and workforce development programs for young folks ages 14 to 24, I also serve as the chair of the Communities That Care Coalition. And um, I really appreciate it, and I think this is uh, speaking from the behalf of a coalition that's been around for a bit and is in this sustaining phase. It's an exciting opportunity to think about what the potential for long-range impact is when community action organizations take a leadership role in these kinds of efforts and some of the ways that it's different than other collaboration that, that we might do. So the Communities That Care Coalition is in our 15th year bringing together schools, family, youth, and other community stakeholders. And we bring these folks together in order to address the underlying risk and protective factors that help to prevent substance use and other risky behaviors to improve young people's ability to reach their full potential and thrive. For the first 10 years or so, we focused more exclusively on substance use prevention and then over time have expanded our focus to include healthy eating and active living and to also really look at and focus on the health disparities that we see locally and the health equity implications of our work. But this approach of looking at the risk and protective factors has been really crucial to our efforts. So rather than targeting specifically behaviors, kind of the just say no approach, we're really looking at the underlying, uh, the underlying factors that make it more or less likely that a young person will experience a negative health outcome. And we use evidence-based strategies, strategies that we know that will work to address them. Our current action plan contains, among several other components, a really detailed logic model to address youth substance use. Again, really focusing on our priority risk factors. That's that green column in the middle. 
One thing that I want to note here is that while our risk factors and our strategies are very driven by specific substance use indicators that are measurable and that we track over time, it has always been a value of this coalition to select strategies that also have an impact on the other issues important to us, things like youth mental health, risky sexual behavior, and school success. I think that this is a really important balance of collective impact initiatives, especially to engage partners who are not single issue organizations. So I believe strongly that collective impact strategies need to be laser focused in order to be effective and to accurately portray the work to potential members. We need to be clear about both what we are and what we are not and define our scope. However, by focusing on these underlying risk factors, the more root causes, it allows us to be effective in more than one area, effectively changing um, multiple negative outcomes at once. Similar to what Trisha was talking about in terms of the complexity of the structure and what it really takes to get things done, um, I want to talk a little bit about our structure. I think we're somewhat unique in that we have two host organizations. So community stakeholders came together in 2002 concerned about youth substance use in our area. And two organizations, Community Action and Partnership for Youth, stepped up to take leadership as we embarked on an extensive needs assessment and planning process using the Communities That Care model to start this coalition and get to work. We maintain this joint hosting of the coalition with Community Action, me in this case, serving as the chair of the coalition, and Partnership for Youth really taking on the primary day-to-day -day tasks of the coalition and really serving as the backbone. We have involvement from a wide array of stakeholders who participate in a variety of ways, and representatives of them sit on our coordinating council which guides the overall direction of the coalition. And then the real work gets done in, we currently have these five work groups that we're utilizing, um, but these have evolved and changed over time, depending on our priority risk factors and the selected strategies. So those work groups are kind of where the rubber meets the road um, and the real work is getting done. We have had lots of different funding over the years from true backbone support to single issue or single strategy support. Um, the larger dollars have mostly come through Partnership for Youth, um, but Community Action has also received a number of grants um, for our work connected to Communities That Care Coalition, and we have also used CSBG funds to this end. The structure of our coalition also allows that other partner organizations can apply for grants in the name of the coalition in order to execute specific strategies from the action plan. Despite the growing buzz around collective impact, I do think it's worth it to mention that this true backbone support is really hard to find and wow, is it important. Um, as Trish talked about, and as we were also hearing from Lillian, having that person who wakes up every day thinking about this initiative is crucial. And in addition to funding that's focused on specific strategies, it's also important to have some funding that is willing to be there over the long haul um, and follow strategies that may evolve over time. It's hard to build coalition momentum if half of the needs that get identified or strategies that get suggested get shot down with, uh, oh, well, that's not in our grant. Um, so as always, I think that with collective impact initiatives, it's a real dance of finding a large enough overlap between mission of the coalition and specific grant requirements and making sure that you are getting and finding the right money to do the right work. So how do we know that it is working? Our data tells us. So Communities That Care Coalition um, does an annual survey of approximately 2,000 high school students across the nine school districts in our service area. And we have been able to see over the last 15 years that substance use rates have declined by close to 50%, well outpacing national trends, 50%. 
So when we think about, well, what's the rationale for investing all of this time and energy and money into collective impact initiatives, this to me is what speaks volumes to that. It's really exciting to see these large community level changes that can take place over a period of time on sticky, tricky issues um, beyond just sort of better coordination of services. Recently, we have also begun dissecting the disparities that we've seen in our local data, specifically looking at key risk factors among youth of color, youth living in families with lower incomes, and LGBTQ youth. So, for example, um, living in an unstable home situation is a risk factor for substance use, and youth from families with lower incomes were almost five times as likely to have a parent in jail than their higher income peers. Another risk factor that we watch really closely is early initiation, and we saw that in our area, youth of color were almost three times as likely to smoke cigarettes before the age of 13, uh, which is a risk factor for much higher rates of addiction throughout their lifetime. So these are just two examples. We've really dissected all of our data broadly around this, and as a result, have both expanded and deepened our focus to look at some of the underlying health equity issues that pertain to our work. So that is just a very brief overview of who we are and two slides of our data. We have tons of it. Um, but I want to draw the connections to collective impact that we've just learned a bunch about. So we had been using this puzzle piece diagram for years. It always seemed like an effective metaphor for our coalition. And then I believe it was in 2012 this really cool thing happened, which was that the Stanford Social Innovation Review came out with this article on collective impact. And a bunch of us read it and said, wow, this sounds an awful lot like what we do, right down to this puzzle piece diagram that was on the cover. And we read it. We certainly learned a few things. And we were also ex excited to see this new term and emphasis and kind of recognition of something that we already knew was so effective. So a year later, when the second article came out, we were thrilled that the Stanford Social Innovation Review chose to highlight Communities That Care Coalition, this tiny little coalition in rural Western Massachusetts, as one of five examples of effective collective impact initiatives around the globe. So how does this model that they designed fit into what we were doing? Or how does what we do fit into this model? So in the interest of time, I'm going to talk specifically about the common agenda, shared measurement, and backbone. We certainly embrace the mutually reinforcing activities and continued communication, but I think those three are big ones that kind of set us apart from some of the other collaborative initiatives in our area. First, our common agenda. It has has been really important for Communities That Care Coalition to be specific and clear. We spent over 10 years focused intensely on substance use in our community, and early on we identified specific measurable targets. Those targets certainly weren't the whole picture, and we've always considered how strategies can, that we use can impact other behaviors like teen pregnancy or dropout. But we've been through many iterative processes of really clearly defining both what we are and what we are not. We cannot move the needle on everything all at once. And so I think that this focus, this kind of lasering down on the specific common agenda has in the ultimate goal is what has allowed diverse partners who may approach the work from very different perspectives and values to be able to work in coalition and collaboration towards the shared end game. It's a little bit of this strange bedfellows concept that I think can really come up with collective impact initiatives, but that's important to consider. Next, shared measurement. I really can't stress enough how much good data has been Communities That Care Coalition's biggest strength. Um, I sometimes sort of chuckle about this and say, who knew that there were so many data nerds out there? But truthfully, I think all of us within our organizations put a lot of effort in, and we want to know beyond the bean counting or widget counting that what we're doing is actually working. The other motivating factor here is that our partner organizations need data. And so as the coalition, we've really been able to position ourselves successfully as offering data as a value added to our community partners. 
In addition to the core questions that we ask on our survey every year, that survey that is done by 2,000 high school students, we've added questions for partners. So for example, we added questions about sexting for the DA's office and uh, an additional set of questions about school climate that our school districts needed to comply with anti-bullying laws. So really looking at shared measurement and our data has been a real value added and motivator for community partners. And lastly, I think it's what has helped us to really be able to move people from the things that we think work, the good intentions, towards strategies that are actually demonstrated to be effective and have real and lasting impact, which are not always the same thing. So the third component that I am going to talk about is this backbone organization concept, because this one is a biggie. You really do need time, resources, and skills to coordinate the work of the coalition. And you also really need time, resources, and skills to do the actual work. All of our partner organizations are busy. We all have too much to do. And I think it's important not to conflate their level of investment with the grant funding and thus staff hours to take on coalition-specific tasks. So certainly there are some things that if they're better coordinated and linked, they can net significant improvements. If we streamline a referral process, we can make sure that people have access to better services. But there's a whole lot else that actually needs someone to do it. And these are tasks that fall outside of the day-to-day -day scope of even our most highly invested partners. There are a lot of considerations regarding the type of backbone organization, whether it's a funding entity, one community organization, a separate organization that builds up just to be the coalition. And I'd really encourage folks that are considering this to check out the second SSIR article because they outline some pros and cons of each. But in an effort here among CAP agencies to determine if collective impact is a good fit for you, I encourage you to think about and really be highly aware of interagency politics that may take place in your local areas um, and to think about whether or not you can effectively manage a collective impact strategy that's able to exist a little bit outside of those. Another consideration here is competing priorities, that the backbone organization needs to be able to maintain their focus on the common agenda that's set forth in the collective impact partnership. Um, and that this can really quickly flop if it's too bound up in one funder's priorities or one organization's priorities instead of the collaborative initiative itself. And there need to be the times and resources and skills focused on this, as Trish said, someone who wakes up every morning focused on this initiative. Uh, lastly, I think it's really worthwhile to take a second and think about what collective impact is not. It is not fast, easy, or cheap, and it is not a silver bullet. However, it can be really, really effective. I am thrilled to see the outcomes that we have demonstrated in our local um, community around youth substance use and as we've embarked further into food access and healthy eating and reducing health disparity, I am thrilled to get to be a part of that and see where it's going to go because we have had such success around mobilizing community level change to impact this issue. And I really, really love to consider the enormous impact that could be seen on a variety of anti-poverty issues with community action organizations at the helm. Um, if collective impact were successfully employed there. I think that there is such amazing potential to move the needle on really complex issues. But it's important to remember that it's a long haul and it's not a substitute for the in-the-moment interventions that are also needed to help people survive. So, um, that is the end of my presentation, and I know that we're already a little bit over time, um, but we did want to have some time for any shared questions, and also I'm going to turn it over to Pat to share some final resources. So I think what I'd like to suggest is that if anybody wants to type any questions for any of the three presenters into the chat box, I'll pass it over to Pat to share the final resource slide, which is also going to be sent out via email, um, and then we'll do our best to answer any questions that come up. So thank you all so much for being here, um, and thanks for sticking around for a little bit after the 11 o'clock end time. I appreciate it. 
Hi, thank you, everyone. Um, as uh, Lev said, we're running uh, we're running a little bit over time, but um, we had a couple of questions in the questions um, section um, of the of your um, of your little menu there. Um, here's some resources. Here's another set of resources that we're going to be emailing you all of these because they all come with links. So we I've developed a actual um, Word document so you can have the links readily available to you for all of these resources. So um, um, Jeff is also going to unmute you. So if you have any final questions you just want to talk about, please do. Um, so one of the questions we had was for those CAAs who are collaborating with others, how do you envision potentially reflecting this as a community level initiative on the CSBG annual report? Now, if you're not a planner, be a, um, a question that that um, you might not be able to answer so we will um, div, you know give that to planners if um, nobody has any idea about that who are our presenters I can share one piece there um, is that I think that the the shift here will be to it will depend on what issues you are looking to address with your collective impact strategy and so identifying which community level um, indicators that exist within Roma match that priority so that you're actually measuring some of the change over time and then like any Thing. So we're looking at, with CTC as an example, our substance use as a whole, and then it's breaking it down into some specific, specific measurable targets along the way. So I think that that is where there is some opportunity built in with Roma already to be looking at that and then figuring out any other specific indicators that might have to be organization defined. Um, but my sense is, is that there's some energy and willingness from MassCap and DHCD to be recognizing the importance of this so that as long as we're able to track the actual outcomes, not just the number of people that we're partnering with, we're actually tracking outcomes over time that we'll be able to include that actually much more effectively uh, with next generation than we've been able to do so in the past. Awesome. Thank you, love. Anybody have any other questions that are uh, unmuted now? This is Jess. Um, if I unmute everybody, then we'll hear a lot of background noise. So um, if anybody wants to just quickly in the, in the chat box um, type that they have a question, um, then I can unmute you specifically and let you speak up, as we'd love to hear from folks. Um, OK, there's a question. Um, the uh, for Community action of Franklin Hampshire Quab and the decreases report seen based on self-reporting questionnaires. Does data also show similar increases in terms of incidences or actual use? That was from so, yeah. Um, I would be happy to, outside of this, share more information about kind of the statistical significance of that, um, but sort of the brief version is that, yes, the um, Teen Health Survey is self-reported. However, it's something that has been, um, it's not a tool that we developed. It's a nationally developed tool that's used across the country um, that has a lot of measures in place to determine that it's fairly accurate and statistically significant. Um, there are basically some, there are some trick questions throughout it so that if it uh, asks things in the same way and if uh, and the data is then clean so that if you've answered one way in one place and one answer in another, um, that there are not uh, then that survey is discounted. Um, there's also questions about how honest people have been. There are some other things that are sort of opportunities for youth to be like silly and not take it seriously and questions that don't seem realistic there, we, we take it out. So I have good confidence in the data um, and it seems like it demonstrates a good, and I just shared some really overall trends, but each of those numbers are conglomerations of lots of different questions that get at very specific use, like how frequently have you done this? within the last 30 days, within the last six months, within the last year or ever. So there are a lot of pieces in there. So yes, it is self-reported. And I, um, 
I have good confidence uh, that it is actually demonstrated. And I will say well, we've also done a bunch of uh, qualitative collection. So we've done lots of focus groups and key stakeholders their interviews to supplement and give us that additional information and it seems to line up um, and that's always a, a really good gut check is when we see that the information that we're getting in the more quantitative forms is really matching up with what we're hearing in qualitative uh, information. Okay, it doesn't seem that we have any more questions um, at this point. If you do have questions, please feel free to uh, send them to Jess um, at the email that you see on your screen. Um, also, you'll be receiving an email from Jess with um, a evaluation that we would really appreciate your filling out. We really do take all evaluations very seriously and we look at them and we, we like to be on continuous quality improvement like everyone else. So, we take um, your evaluations into consideration when we're doing any future webinars or training. So if that is it from everybody, thank you so much for joining us and for hanging in there for an extra 22 minutes. Um, we'll get better at timing <laughs> when we do these webinars. We're still learning. So thank you all and um, have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone.